Hey friends, this is Waylon Lewis. I'm back with yet another unbelievable guest. I'm very excited about this one. Um, most of them I'm not excited about, I just pretend. And uh, no, really, I'm, I'm very genuinely excited about this one. It's Ellie Lacks, founder of The Gentle Barnes. I think we have to put a plural on it at this point. Ellie, welcome. I'm a real journalist and I do some tough interviews and is really uncomfortably pleasant right now to be interviewing someone I feel like doing an infomercial for. Um, tell everyone about what you do and why is it so wonderful? Why am I so excited? <laughs> um, well, first of all, thank you so much for having me. The Gentry Barn is a 24 year old national organization located in Los Angeles, California. Nashville, Tennessee, and St. Louis, Missouri. So you started in 99 or 2000? We started in 1999. Wow. And we are home to horses, cows, pigs, sheep, goats, chickens, turkeys, peacocks, llamas, emus, dogs. Um, and we take in specifically animals that have nowhere else to go that are unadoptable. So they're too old, too sick, too lame, or too scared to be adoptable. We bring them in, we rehabilitate them with a whole slew of methods, including acupuncture, massage therapy, chiropractics, energy healing, animal communication, and of course, lots and lots of love. Once they're happy and healthy, if we can find them homes of their own, that would be great. And if not, then we give them sanctuary with us for the rest of their lives. And then if and when they're ready, we partner with them to heal people with the same stories of trauma and connect people to the love and magic of animals. Uh, I feel like you're so pro at saying this. You've you've said this once or twice before. So, <laughs> so what kind of homes, if they can find a home, what kind of homes do you look for? Other rescue farms or? Um, you know, there are individuals that have land and they say, oh, we'd like a few sheep or a few goats or um, a horse or a dog. Um, the only, we have, we have adopted out chickens and turkeys. The only animal that we've never adopted out is a cow, which I think is crazy because I think everyone in the entire world should have a cow. They're the best. Yeah. We have a couple local sanctuaries here and there's um, one cow in particular, who's a giant, like, I don't know, three tons or something. I don't know how big, but just a giant. And, and he um, is like a huge puppy dog. He loves cuddling. He's incredibly affectionate. Yeah. I only have a normal yard back here, but I, if I had a couple hundred acres or dozen acres or whatever, I can imagine having a cow that wasn't being exploited um, would be like having a huge puppy. They are giant, giant puppies. They look just like dogs to show affection. They love tummy rubs. They love cuddles. Yeah. Um, we have cows that walk on leash and come when we call their names. They're amazing. I want to ask, I'm going to assume, are you vegan? Oh, of course. Yes. So um, when did you become vegan? Like what, how did all this sort of start way back? I mean, in the nineties, almost nobody was vegan. Well, I'll take you back even further. Um, the gentle barn was my dream since I was seven years old. Um, I was born loving animals. I saw them as my best teachers, healers, and friends. Um, and it perplexed me that the people around me didn't see me that see animals that way. They saw a little them. dog in the background just agreed <laughs> with you heartily. Yes, little one has a lot to say. Um, but you know, I was confused as to why the people around me didn't love animals the way that we that I did. And from the time I was seven, I kept saying, "When I grow up, I'm gonna have a big place full of animals, and I'm gonna show the world how beautiful they are." And it was my dream, but I didn't know how to start it, so I procrastinated for a really, really long time. And then I finally. But before, but before you go forward, I feel like so many children love animals, right? We read about animals in children's books, but how did you stick with that? Like, was it your parents? Was it just you having this dream? Like, how did that not? How did that dream not die? You know, honestly, um, I was going through a lot of challenges growing up, um, not fitting in, feeling lonely, feeling a little different than other people because I realized that I loved animals and they didn't. And um, it was always animals that I kept turning to. And the worse my life got, the more I turned to animals. And so that connection with animals was never, ever, ever lost. I went vegetarian when I was 11 years old because it was a chicken in my school. And I realized that the principal was going to take her to the slaughterhouse. And I went home that day and said I was never going to eat animals again. 
And then 24 years ago, when I finally was uh, told what happens in the dairy and egg industry, I went vegan on the spot. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. Someone asked if we're both vegan. I am vegan. I've been vegan for a long time. Um, and it was a similar story, but I didn't stick with it. So when I was a little kid at six years old or whatever, I was told like we were eating pasta or something and with that we were eating like ham or something. I was like, are you kidding? I've been reading a children's book today about pigs. And so I went vegan on the spot, but it was like 1980, 1980. And no one around me, you know, it wasn't a thing. And of course I, I dropped it. I lost, I lost it after a while. So I really admire that. Like you kept turning to that, you know, I just have a new puppy. I showed you before we went live and, you know, I had like a rough year last year and having a puppy, just being around an animal, there's so much healing and joy and I can see that as a kid, you know, they're called, you know, there's animals are used for therapy all the time for that reason. Yes, I agree. Yes, I, agree. Um, um, I mean, I don't I mean, know. I'm either the most needy person on the face of the earth, or I just don't understand how people survive life without hugging a cow and being with these animals. I, I, every day I have to hug them at least once a day. <laughs> Here, I'll show, we had a request for the puppy. There's the puppy. Oh, he's so gorgeous. Yeah. Um, so, you know, you're, I think from the outside, you know, especially if you're an animal lover or a vegan, which can be two different things, um, you're like living the dream life. But as someone who runs a business with a reasonably sized staff, are you able to manage, I mean, how many gentle barns are there now? Three. Yeah. So you must have a lot of staff and volunteers and moving parts and logistics and emergencies and all fundraising, all kinds of moving parts, right? Yeah, it's crazy. We have three locations. We have 200 animals. We have about 50 staff, hundreds of volunteers. Um, wow. It is a full-time job and then some. And um, I don't know, I wake up in the morning and I keep running until I flop down at night and start again the next day. <laughs> That's my life. <laughs> And are you able to maintain that joy and that connection with the animals and like the joy and love in the mission? Or do you get caught up in, I mean, running a business that big, even if it's a nonprofit is a lot, right? It's a lot. It's a lot. It's a lot. Yeah. It's a lot. Doing a lot. It, it's, it's, it's so much because we have to raise the money and then we have to spread the awareness and then we have to host the groups and then we rehabilitate the animals and rescue more. And um, I feel lucky every second of my day that I get to do it, but it is a lot. It is a big job and it is definitely not for the faint of heart. And whenever I feel exhausted um, or defeated, I go out to the barnyard and those animals recharge my batteries and keep me going. Oh, I love hearing that. So if everyone watching here uh, isn't already, follow The Gentle Barn and is donating the best way that we can help? What's the one way we can get involved or help? Yes, I mean, donating, we can't do any of this work without the help of the community to afford the hay and the vet care and run our programming. So donating is such a big need, of course, because with every dollar that comes in means another life that we can save. Yeah. Um, the other way people can help is of course, follow us on social media, fall in love with these animals and share it with their friends and family. And honestly, the biggest way people can help is to go vegan because every person that goes vegan saves 200 animals. And the more we go vegan- Like every year, you mean? Every year, yeah. yeah. One person that goes vegan saves 200 animals a year, 1,100 gallons of water a day, an acre of trees every year, and we decrease our own risk of Western disease by 90%. So it's a win-win for the planet, for animals, and for our health. And most importantly- you know, once the world goes vegan, we're not going to need sanctuaries. We'll just all love animals together. So if you want to help animals, really, yeah. you know, yeah. my goal in life is to work myself out of a job. We'll have a vegan world and we'll just be able to love animals together. It's such a beautiful and simple vision. It's like almost like out of some fundamental text. I want to say the Bible, but there's all kinds of different philosophies all over the world. But if we could just all live on this earth in harmony, not killing and torturing each other. 
not going into war, not raping, not doing all these awful things. You know, like so many people, I have a big social media presence. So many people are commenting saying, oh, your dog, dogs are so lovely. Dogs are the best. And I'm always like, please extend the love you have for your dog or, or from afar for my dog to all dogs. I mean, I mean, to all animals, like all animals are this worthy of feeling safe. I'm gesturing at my dog, um, safe and loved and cared for. And, and they give us so much in return. I agree. And, you know, I think that there is that disconnect because obviously we're used to having dogs, cats, and even horses as part of our families, but it's right. less common for people in the city to come across cows, chickens, pigs, turkeys, and that's really why the gentle barn exists. Because when I met a chicken at the age of 11, it was obvious to me that I was no longer gonna eat animals. And if everybody can have that connection to hug a cow, cuddle a turkey, give a pig a tummy rub, hold a chicken, look into their eyes, hear their stories of resilience and realize that we are all the same, then going vegan is a no brainer. And so we're so opening we're gentle barns so, barn so people can people come, come in and have and those have experiences, experiences and realize that a cow, a pig, a sheep, we're all the same. Yeah, I mean, you and I can talk all day until you're blue in the face, but when you go to the rescue, to the farm, to the barn, and you can you know, actually connect with an animal, right? It's all right there. As someone said, is this utopic? Is this a utopia? I mean, we can do it. The definition of a utopia is it's unrealistic and it's the only thing holding us back from this is us. Like we can be kind to animals starting today. I'm vegan, I'm 200 pounds, I climb, I bike, I whatever, you know, I'm active. Um, it's not to say that different people don't have different health issues, but overall veganism is way healthier and healthier for the planet, the next generations who are you know, gonna live on a cooked planet. And it's also torturing. Like, you know all this, Ellie, but it really, it hit me in the same way. I was vegetarian for like, for 10 years or something. But when you look at dairy, you know, there's actually torture involved, separating the little calves from their moms. It's awful. And, and you know, then the dairy moms get killed, et cetera, et cetera. You know all this. The chicks get ground up often. Like, it's no better. So you kind of got to go vegan and just be full of love. I don't think that's utopic. Love should not be utopic. Love should be the norm in our society. And, yeah. you know, it's interesting, um, you know, with Mother's Day um, mm. around the corner, I like to say that going vegan is a feminist issue because it's the mothers that are suffering for people to eat their babies. Their babies. Um, the dairy industry, the only way that you can get breast milk from a cow is to impregnate that cow and, and have that cow have a baby. It's breast milk. And so... They have to create a baby to have the breast milk, but then the baby is killed and the breast milk stolen for people. And the same with the meat industry. Um, they impregnate the moms who have the babies that then go off to slaughter and then the moms are impregnated again. So it's a feminist issue. It's something that all moms should stand up um, against. It's something that, you know, if you have a mom, if you are a mom, if you understand being a mom, it's time to stop exploiting animal moms because they want to love, nurture, protect, and raise their babies just like we do. And yeah, it's a, I mean, you know all this, but it's a human rights issue. Like the people who work in factory farming have incredibly high rates of depression and suicide and trauma. You know, it's not good for Climate change is a major driver of climate change. And if you care about children and your grandchildren, et cetera, you got to care about animal welfare. You know, I'm Buddhist and, it, and the Buddha was teaching this stuff like, you know, thousands of years ago. I mean, it's not like a new radical idea. It's an old radical idea, I guess. Yeah. So, but getting back to your story, someone said, how did it start? We got into some of that, but tell me a little bit more about that chicken. So there's one chicken at your school, it sounds like, and you made a relationship with the chicken? Yeah, so I don't know why she was there, but they had a chicken in a cat carrier in the corner of the auditorium. And it must've been recessed because all the kids were racing around, playing, laughing, being really, really loud and chaotic. And I zeroed in on this chicken and out of hundreds of students, I was the only one that noticed she was even there. And wow. I, crossed a, I, I crossed the auditorium 
knelt down, opened the crate, pulled her into my arms. She was trembling violently. And I kept telling her that I was here. She's not alone. It's okay. I was holding her and rocking her in my arms. Eventually she stopped shaking and she settled down. I was singing to her and talking to her. And then um, about 10 minutes later, the principal came in um, and said, don't pet the chicken, she's gotta go to the slaughterhouse. And she yanked her out of my arms and walked out of the school. And my little 11 year old brain was like, I don't, I don't understand what that means. What is she talking about? And it was in that moment, it felt like a punch in the face that I realized that is chicken and rice. And I went home that day after school and I told my parents, I will never eat animals again. And mm. I, they, at first they, didn't take me seriously and tried to give me chicken soup. And then they said that I was going to die and be anemic and not grow. Um, but here I am, I'm 55 years old and I made it. Yeah. <laughs> and I'm healthier. And, you made it, than and it's actually people. healthier. I mean, it's yeah. so hard to get through sometimes. I'm like, you know, obviously health is a complex issue. You know, everyone's different, but overall it's way healthier. Heart disease is like the number one or number two killer in the U S and that's intimately related with, you know, consumption of, red meat and you know come on milk is not it's not what's good for you or whatever the slogan was so um you know years ago with elephant i was thinking oh in my spare time i'm gonna i'm gonna leave boulder and i'm gonna you know go back to vermont where i went to high school or something and start a sanctuary do you encourage other people to start sanctuaries or is it better to go contribute to your local sanctuary because gosh knows it's so much work and people don't know what they're getting into kind of thing. Listen, I mean, I think the world needs more sanctuaries because with more sanctuaries, um, more people are exposed to these beautiful, beautiful animals, right? So, yeah. I mean, if somebody has the wherewithal to start a sanctuary, I think that's fantastic. And as a matter of fact, I'm co-founder of The Gentle Barn and my husband, Jay Weiner, and I teach a course. Um, it's a 12-week it's a course where we teach people how to open a sanctuary and what they need, what they need to have, what they need to know. It completely prepares somebody to know the basics of going into running a sanctuary. So we, we definitely want to help people and encourage people to do it. But I have to kind of reiterate that if one person going vegan saves 200 animals a year, you don't have to open a sanctuary to be a sanctuary. Yeah, that's so important. I mean, there's some level of like, it must feel wonderful, but it also must feel frustrating that, you know, 200 beings all need so much care and love and attention as all of us beings do. And there's millions and billions of beings out there not getting that. So the exactly what you just said, uh, you know, we can save and, and serve so many more lives and so much more love by just going vegan today. Yeah, I mean, you could open a sanctuary and bring in 200 animals, or you could go vegan from your apartment and save 200 animals. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so do you ever think about, like, do you have um, vegan food on the premises? Like, you must think about, like, uh, restaurants at the sanctuary, and, and um, I don't know, I, I feel like there needs to be, like, a really good vegan chain restaurant with integrity, which I still don't really feel like there is that I know of. It's always been um, me and Jay's dream to have a restaurant at the Gentle Barn um, so yeah, far yeah. because of zoning laws and just our giant to-do list. We've never gotten to it, um, but we have a garden. We have a vegetable garden and um, we have all kinds of programs for underprivileged and underserved uh, children and adults. And they can come and pick vegetables from the garden. They can help feed the animals. They can bring vegetables home and teach their families at home what to do mm -hmm. with it and how to prepare it. Mm. you're so inspiring so this and coming back to that course real quick um that's on your site is that all like virtual you just sign up and you get the videos and that kind of thing uh, oh no no um the actual course is in person so it's on oh. zoom it's on zoom and the first 10 weeks are um it's an interactive class curtail to your dream because not all sanctuaries look alike and not all people want to start the same version of a sanctuary. And so we want to know what your dream is and what is the dream coming through you specifically 
where do you want your sanctuary? What kind of animals do you want to rescue? Uh, do you want to be open to the public and serve the community? Or do you want to just be closed? So we find out first and foremost what dream is coming through you. And then the entire course is specifically for what you're trying to build and how to do it. And then the last two classes are reserved for when you're actually up and running. So you can have two classes with me and Jay about like, okay, we just got in these two horses. What do we do? Or we're having these fundraising issues. What do we do? And so it's like real life classes, the last two. And there must be a lot to it. Like there's, you have to have a veterinarian, you have to have the fundraising, you have to have the social media, you have to actually know how to run a farm on some level. We talk about zoning, buildings, structures, stalls, how to feed the animals. We talk about veterinarians, volunteers. We talk about programming. We talk about um, staff. We talk about um, contracts and hold harmlesses and how to protect yourself legally. Um, and we talk, there's, there's several classes that are actually reserved for things that you wouldn't think of. We talk about compassion fatigue. Mm. We prepare people because when you're running a sanctuary or even when you're an empath or a vegan or a very sensitive person living in this world, um, just the things that go on in this world, let alone running a sanctuary and having animal issues, um, you're going to come up against compassion fatigue and we prepare people so that they don't crumble, fall and fail, that they can keep going. We talk about how to walk animals home with dignity because there's very specific ways that you can be there for animals at the very, very end. Mm. Um, we have a whole course dedicated to veganism, not just teaching about veganism, because obviously like for, you know, you're, for you as an example, you are already vegan, but we talk about how to teach veganism and how in, to inspire others to go vegan through your sanctuary. Um, mm. It's so sort it's, of the public relations and the mission radiating out of the, the sanctuary. Yeah. Because probably a lot of people I would imagine think about the animals in the sanctuary, but then are like, you know, and want to be open on some level to, to the public, but then, you know, that's the whole thing, like tours and how to talk to people. And it sounds yeah. so overwhelming just thinking about it. It's like 18 different things. Yeah. And that's a whole course. And then of course we have a course for development. Um, mm. It's, it's really great because, you know, when I first started the gentle barn, we didn't have social media and I was one out of maybe three sanctuaries existing in America. And right. so I really wanted to get in front of everyone in America. So my original dream was to have a gentle barn in every state. Now, over the course of the last 24 years, it's been, it's taking too long, but meanwhile, while we've built the, the three sanctuaries that we do have, we now have social media so we can get in front of a global audience. And there's other sanctuaries popping up all over the place. And so instead of us having a gentle barn in every state, Jay and I were like, well, let's teach other people to do this so that it can happen faster. Right. If you can help create the culture, that's so smart. 